Hi, everyone. We are Creative, and we are glad to be here today to, to show you how the studio manages and handles these heavy shots. So, this is us. Here is Tanguy, the first of the class. And also, uh, <coughs> so, sorry, and also a CG supervisor at the studio in charge of some different projects. And myself, Axel, head of the CG and in charge of Tanguy. <laughs> so we have divided this talk into six parts, starting by telling you what the project we have been working on over the last few years, followed by a small demo tape to illustrate what the, the, the diversity of our project, but also to, to, to show you what we, what we faced and what we have been going through during these productions. This will allow us to, to tell you why we, we choose to, to think and use a, a level of detail systems that we will describe on the next part. On the level of detail, we won't hold any secrets for you. We will show you the, the way they are used in the shot and how we manage them. And the last part is the most precise part on the geometry node. And we will show you how we use it to, to create different levels of details. So we let Tanguy present the last project. So, um, uh, hi everyone. Uh, one uh, important thing to, to know about us is that we've been stuck on um, Blender 2.79 for the past few years because of uh, pipeline inertia and the, the length of our project that uh, take us often more than two years. Um, uh, we had to use uh, this uh, old version of, of Blender for quite a time. We switched to Blender 3 at the beginning of um, 2022, and uh, by doing that, we got all of a sudden a lot of new features. So at the same time, we got EV, Grease Pencil, um, Collections, Geometry Nodes, and uh, Cycle X. So it felt like Christmas, but it meant that we had a lot of work on our hand uh, to rethink our way of doing things, to reinvent our pipeline, and to make sure that uh, we would adapt to properly take advantage of all the new features of, uh, of Blender. Some uh, of our shows uh, are not made with uh, Blender yet. Uh, some of them, like uh, Kailu, that you can see on the, on the left, have an history with uh, other softwares. In this case, it's uh, 3ds Max. And um, because we have thousands and thousands of assets uh, we cannot afford to transfer all of them uh, into, into Blender. That would be way too expensive. So we still have to open 3ds Max, which is a pain when all the other projects are, are done within Blender. Some other projects like uh, De Gaulle à la Plage in the, in the middle there uh, are 2D, 2D projects. And uh, we've not dived yet into Grease Pencil, but that's uh, definitely in, a, in our plan. And um, we are eager to, to look more closely into it. And lastly, some of our pro projects, like uh, Athleticus, um, have been made uh, outside of Blender for the um, three first seasons, but the, the, the next season, the fourth one, is currently in production at Cube, and uh, it's uh, finally made uh, with, uh, with Blender. So we tend to, to a point where uh, every, um, each of our projects will be made uh, with, uh, with Blender. So here's a small demo of uh, our project.
Thank you. So now I'm going to talk for a bit about the, the challenges that we faced during the, those past production and what led us to, to uh, rethink in, uh, our pipeline and to want to use a um, level of detail system for our assets. So first in uh, 2018, uh, we worked on our first project on Blender that we presented back in the Beacon 18. And um, this project was a mush mush and uh, it featured a lot of heavy forest sets and um, dense vegetation backgrounds. Um, because we were using 2.79 at the time, uh, we, all, we had to do all the scattering uh, using the old particle system. And I'm sure the, the one uh, of you who used it know that it's a, it's a pain to get things to behave in a stable way and predictive way. So that, that was quite a challenge. And um, on the next show, uh, which is Tangra Animals here, you can see that the sets are much simpler and much lighter, but uh, the challenge was more on the uh, characters part. We, we all had really often a um, lot of characters animated on screen, and even if they have uh, very simple geometrical shapes, this doesn't mean that uh, the rigs are light and heavy. And heavy. Um, so um, it was a struggle to, to give our animators um, responsive and light scenes with uh, this many characters in it. And um, the last but not the least, um, this show is a Pirate. It was one of the last show we delivered uh, with a Blender, also made on Blender 2.79. And uh, this show featured a lot of heavy sets with uh, vegetation and a uh, high number of objects, and also a large number of um, complex characters animation. So the, it, it was still a struggle to, to have uh, responsive scenes and light scenes. So all of this led us to, to, um, to create a, a new way of dealing with the level of details on our different assets. So um, now we'll let uh, Axel uh, give you a more detailed presentation about uh, this level of detail uh, system. Yes. As Tanguy said, we were on Blender 2.79 at the time. And since the production were already launched, we could not benefit from the improvement of the newer versions. So this spring, the, the switching in Blender 3 gave us the, the opportunity to, to rethink our pipeline and to add a notion of level of detail, system what we can also find in the production of video games. So, to do so, we start by determining the, the needs we have at the different steps of the productions, both in terms of definitions and control per asset type. We mean asset type like the background, the props, the character, or the camera. For example, for during, uh, during the layout, what we need is a high level, uh, high level of control on the background to be able to do the set rest properly. But we also need a reasonable control on the character and the props, but not on too high level of control because we, we don't want to spend too much time on animated detail at this stage. It's not the point on the, during, the, during the layout. So we also need a high level of control of the camera to to check the framing with all the options to, to check the focal lines, depth of field, so uh, maybe sometimes the motion blur. About the, the level of quality of the asset, we are in, at the, at the mid-level. So not to weigh down the shot too much, but to, to keep a good overview of what the final framing will be. When we go to the animation part, at this step, what we need is a maximum FPS and fluidity. So we will decrease the level of quality of the asset, but we will also upgrade the level of control we have on it, except for the background, because the background has been set beforehand. We don't need, any, we don't need a high level of control of it. So we can just downgrade it and let it. Thanks, we arrive on the rendering step. At this step, the, the problem is quite different. All, all we need here is a full definition of the asset, but we don't need any level of control of these of this elements because all the elements have been set on the previous step, 
and they're approved, so we don't, we don't need to, to touch them anymore. Here is the creation process of this level of detail. So we, group, we, we can find uh, three kinds of level of detail in modeling, shading, and the rigging. Here we regroup modeling and shading because at the studio it's often the, the same artist who works on the, on the both steps at the same time. So on each of these types, we start with a level of, with a base of five levels of details, but we can, of course, increase or decrease this number according to the specificities of the project. We, we don't have to use them all the time at every production. So. About the, the creation process, we, we rely on our push-pull system we had uh, in our pipeline. We mean by push when we make available for the next steps. So, for example, if we, can, if we take an, an artist in a modeling or shading, he can push his work, so make available to the next step, and he is, is working file, and uh, any increase or decrease states of uh, his work, so basically just a sample sieve of this work to the, to the, to the right repository in the, in the push file. But it uh, has been sometimes with some automatic process that it will increase or increase this work. Basically for the, all the simple rigs, we can make it by a simple click on a button when we are in the modeling scene. But for the, for the more specific version in the rigging, we just made it manually with the, by our rig team with our auto rig or made auto rig. Here is a spreadsheet where we can find what we had on the different level of details. So we will start with the rigging with the lower one. It's a fully locked asset, and we will go to the full rig with the, made with the auto rig, and sometime with the special rigs when we where we. We can add some character effects like soft body or simulations. About the modeling, we, we start with a, with a plane to a version of the asset with collapse subdivision where we can add some depressment map. And about the shading, we just restart with a, an asset picture we will use for the plane versions to different versions of the, of the shader, more or less greedy in resource with, of course, uh, their adapt texture size. Let's move on the illustrated version of it. It will be more meaningful, I think. So I introduce you to Giorgio, a character of the Firebird series. So we will find its lower rigging, uh, lower uh, rigging level of detail. That we, at this stage, we just have the the asset in reference is a scene, so we, we, we don't have any access on it. And in the next level of, de level of detail of the rigging, we will just merge the asset in the scene, but we keep the data in reference, so we, can, we, we are going to, to just select the element and place it in the shot, but just in a rigid mode. Then we go to the, what we call the base rig, Usually it's just a, just a short rig with some global controllers who allow us to, to change the origin if we need, but, if we, but it allows us to, to add some constraint between the, this asset and the other element in the shot. Then we find the main rigging. This is the rig made with, made with the, our auto rig. And the last one is the, the special rig. So in, in, this, in this show, the the character, Giorgio, has the ability to, to extend its members so far. So we had planned to, to make a, a separate rig to a much, a much heavier, but we can just choose to, to use it when we add in a couple of shots. About the modeling, we will find the plane representing the asset, and we will go to the version with collapse some divisions where we could add some uh, displacement, displacement map. So still in this show, the, all, the, all the assets are in, a, in an inflatable plastic, so when we are close to the, to the camera, we, we add some, 
displace with the, yeah, for, for, the, for the fold in the plastic. And on the shading row, we will find the picture of the, of the old Giorgio to use it well with, the, with the plane. We will find a version of the shader without any maps. And then we will go to the a version with very low maps, just using in the, in the viewport for the animators. And the two heavier version, so this is the, the version for the rendering. And the last one is the version with the displacement map. No. Just have a look on what we found uh, if we go to the, to the props. So we will find the same configuration here, but just with a small change on the, on the highest rigging, where this time we will have the, the same rig as the main rigging, but we just add some simulation on the leaf, like a wind or automatic delay. But for the modeling and the shading, it's exactly the, the same evolutions. Just have a look at what we have on the, on the background. No, this is a, a boat, still from the Firewatch series. Just for the background, we usually limit the, the highest level on I1, we call it I1. So in a, in a way, if we need an, an even bigger definition on a part of the set, we will tend to just take the element out of the set and make it a separate prop, not to burden the whole set with just an element on a, in a corner. But for the, for the rest, it's exactly the same evolution that we, we can see on the, on the other slide. Just a last slide with a, on Athleticus with a more realistic asset, basically uh, just a cat. And we will see the, we'll find the, the same evolution as, the, the, in the, in the, as we can find in the cartoon, uh, cartoon series. But just uh, with a little difference on the right to rigging, where we, we start uh, rigging with muscle, thanks to the add-on X muscles. It's still under progress on our side, but we're quite confident about it, and I think we will use it in the future, future project. Speaking of Athleticus, we will now show you how we use all these leads in the shot and how we manage them. Here is the shot we are talking about. With this, uh, it just, we can find assets in the foreground. In the mid shot, we will find some animals, and there is a, a crowd on the, on the background. Don't, our, um, the, we start with our sun builder, who works thanks to a, a breakdown list, who tells you, who tell us what's, what the, what the asset we will need, and thanks to a config file who will tell us what kind of level of detail we will merge into the shot. So basically all the modding and shading are merged in a very neutral mode, in the mid-level. So it, it is the role to the layer tarsis to, to adjust it and to, to add definition if you add for the foreground and to decrease it for the, for the background. The, the background are merge in, uh, in reference in the shot, so it's the lowest rigging level of detail. And all the, all the props and the character are merged in a, with a, the very short rig with just some couple of controllers, global controllers. So let's stop a, a little longer at our asset manager. This is the main tool here. This is uh, the tool we, who who will allow us to, to manage all the level of details. So it will list all the assets we have on, on the shot. It will also let us enable or disable them if we need it. And we will find some display option like uh, to, to show or hide the meshes or show or hide the armature. We will also find the, some drop down lists at the middle who to let us know what is the, which, which level of detail we have on the shot. And it's thanks to this drop-down list that we can in, improve, we can in, uh, improve or uh, no, increase or decrease, sorry, the, the level of detail. 
So I will show you an example right after. So here is the, the last. This is just a screenshot of, uh, of, the, of the layout. With the, we can see the we can see the, the assets have been increased in the modeling and shading level of the tail. The, the element in, at the middle that just plays with the short week version. And the crowd on the background uh, just be, uh, be decreased in the low one rigging in the way that we just put them in the, in the, in the shots and we'll add some alambic caches with idle animations. It will be enough for their presence on, on the screen. Oh. This, is, uh, oh. this is our uh, asset manager. So at the, at the animation, all the animator has the, the ability to to select the, the rig and to increase in it to, to, to find the, the main rig to be able to do the, the animation, just the animation. So it, and all the, on the previous key, on the short rig are kept thanks to the action system we can find on, on Blender. Here is the final shot with the animations. So, the animations are not really detailed here. It will take uh, too much time, for them. maybe for a future uh, talk, maybe. But all the animation, are, the animation has done. All the caches on the background, on the character on the background, are are loaded, and the, we can find the assets on the foreground with uh, with higher, higher modeling and rigging level of detail. Up. Here is the rendering step. So at this step, we find again our send builder to still thanks to a config file. We'll merge different LODs that we load from the layout the steps. And usually, we just, we just need the rendering versions of the, of the assets. So we'll merge what we call the I1 and I1 modeling and I1 shading. And all the about the, the rigging level of detail, we are in the what we call low one. So we just put the, the meshes on the on the shots, and we had the, the cache and animations. Sometimes we just uh, add uh, an actions with backend metadata like visibility or animate each other if we have it. So that's uh, for the global view of our pipeline and our LOD management. I will let you in the capable of hands of Tanguy to, to show you how we use the uh, geometry nodes to create these LODs. So um, uh, at Cube, I'm currently in charge of the technical supervision of a project called the Seven Bears. Uh, it's um, produced by Netflix in uh, Folivari. And um, as you can see on this image, it has a lot of heavy vegetation backgrounds with a, a dense forest. Unfortunately, I, I won't be able today to show you any uh, behind the scene images of the, of the assets. But uh, anyway, I will use placeholders geometry to, to illustrate my points. Um, so, on, on this show, um, we chose to, to do many things the procedural way. So that includes uh, set dressing, asset creation, and uh, most of the shading. And, um, and this has uh, many advantages. So first of all, in terms of um, RAM usage, uh, our render farm is uh, GPU-based. So of course, uh, maintaining the, the RAM usage to the lowest point possible is a, is a must for us. And um, procedural shading helps a lot uh, with that. It also makes um, assets uh, reusable uh, very uh, easily. Uh, you can see on the, on the right side of the screen our asset library, uh, which is in this case the, the shader library part uh, that allows us to, to share between projects and between artists within the same project 
uh, shaders, node groups, and other assets. We presented this uh, these tool in, back in uh, 2018 uh, at uh, our first Blender conference appearance. We, uh, with, uh, thanks to, to procedural workflow, we, we also can do a very easily correction and fine tuning on assets. This is very important for us because we have a lot of back and forth with the projection, projection designer and uh, the directors of the show. Uh, so, so it's important for us to be able to correct uh, the color or the scale of a pattern on a shader very, very easily without having to re-export many, many maps. We also uh, can avoid UVA unwrapping while doing um, procedural shading most of the time. I will tell you a bit more about that uh, in, a, in a few slides. And um, we also are happy to, to avoid, in most of the case, uh, texture handling. It's always a, a joy to have everything within the Blender file and uh, within the shader. It uh, makes things easier to, to manage. And um, also with the procedural shaders, uh, resolution issue um, are much easier to, to, to handle. It's, uh, it's always easier to add detail to a procedural shader uh, than having to, to increase the resolution of textures that you don't necessarily have uh, when, you, when you figure out that your shader lacks detail. So, of course, every choice uh, comes with uh, its uh, downsides. And um, when choosing to, to work uh, procedurally, um, uh, this meant that um, we had to train artists to, to do so and um, to hope that they were willing to take this path with us. So in, in terms of challenges, of course, uh, basic, basic math are, are not avoidable and this is not to the taste of everybody. And sometimes when uh, training artists, I tend to forget that uh, everybody doesn't find it as fun as I do. Um, doing the things the procedural way doesn't mean that you don't have to optimize things. Um, uh, we have to be careful not to push the level of detail further than needed. Some of the nodes, when used extensively, like um, noise texture with um, too much detail, can be a bit um, excessive in, um, in performance usage. And we also try to keep the, the node count to the, to the bare minimum uh, in order to make uh, on one side the shaders lighter, but also uh, on the other hand, uh, much um, easier to understand by other artists or other projects, or even yourself when you come back to it uh, after a few weeks' time. So um, the, the marvelous node tree you can see on the right uh, is brought uh, to you by Simon Thomas. It was uh, posted on Twitter during uh, last November, I think. And um, just a, a side note here, if, you, if you're willing to to deepen your knowledge about uh, procedural workflow, I highly recommend uh, Simon's tutorials that are available on the, on the Blender Studio website. Uh, it's a great resource and uh, we, we use it to, to train our artists. It's a really um, compre comprehensive and uh, well explained. And one last shaders with a procedural workflow is um, uh, concerns uh, shading mostly, but uh, EV struggles to sometimes to compile heavy node trees and complex procedural shaders. So we want to make sure that the, um, the animators don't have to wait 15 minutes when opening their shots to wait for shaders compilation and the colors to appear in the viewport. This is why we, um, we built a lowest level of detail as Axel uh, explained earlier, for every shaders uh, that would be compatible with the viewport usage. And we just try to keep consistent in terms of uh, color, roughness, metalness, and basically that's it. So now we'll I will share a few, a few tips, a few methods that we use uh, at Blender. Hopefully you will find one or two that will uh, fit your needs. Please do not hesitate to stop me at any point if something is unclear or if you want further detail on uh, one of those cases. So first of all about um, <clears throat> UV usage, 
when I said that uh, we were avoiding undropping UVs, I didn't mean that we were avoiding uh, the usage of UV channel as a whole. Of course, we heavily rely on it because it's the safest way to, to make sure that the textures will follow the, the mesh deformations. And um, one thing to keep in mind is that um, the procedural shader workflow in Blender and procedural textures like uh, Noise and Voronoi um, behave very well when mapped on um, 3D vector fields. So what we do on all of our assets is that we, we bake the location and the position of every vertices in the um, UV channels. So of course we need two of them to store the three dimensions of the, um, of the mesh. Um, the good thing about this is it doesn't require any technical knowledge. Uh, you can just use the, um, um, a very handy to remember shortcut, which is UV, U for unwrapping UVs and V for project from view. You just have to make sure that you're in um, orthographic front view and top view and uh, to project the, the UVs and it will automatically store the location data in the UV channels. And then when uh, combining them in the shaders, this is what you got. So on the left uh, column, you, uh, it's the shaders, uh, a simple Voronoi shader and the vector field mapped on the position input. And on the right side is with the custom uh, XYZ UVs. So as you can see on the bottom, the texture basically maps in the exact same way, but with the benefits of following um, the mesh deformation, which is uh, really crucial when uh, using animation cache on, uh, on a mesh that uh, hasn't got any rig. And of course, this, uh, this uh, method works as well, no matter the complexity of the, of the shader that, uh, that, you, that you map on it. So um, then a bit more about uh, sharing our procedural shaders. Of course, not groups um, are, are used in this case. And we try to, um, to think a lot about what have to be kept hidden inside of the not group to make things simpler and what has to be kept outside of it. The, the goal here is to find the right balance between uh, reducing the complexi complexity of usage without losing too much uh, flexibility. What we ended up doing for most of our shaders is, in terms of input, keeping the, the vector information outside of the node to make sure that, so outside of the node group, to make sure that uh, the artist will be allowed to decide how they want to map the shaders on the, on the surface. Um, and we also keep, uh, in terms of inputs, the basic information of, uh, of colors and uh, sometimes a few maps to mask a few things. And in terms of outputs, we always keep our principal shaders outside of the node groups. This makes, this, this makes it much easier to blend between two uh, pre-made shaders. For example, if you have a metal shader and a rust shader, you want to combine them with a mask. It's always much easier when you have uh, the two, two shaders uh, visible outside of node groups and uh, you, you've got much more freedom. The, um, so we, we expose uh, most of the time three, three informations, which is the albedo, so the, the base color of the, of the shader, the roughness, which can still be tweaked outside of the node group with a map range or color ramp, and the height. We, we keep the bump, um, the bump node outside of node groups because we want to be able to adjust the, the height of the bump according to the, the scale of the asset or how the texture is mapped to, to the mesh. So now a bit about uh, set dressing and uh, procedural modeling. So in this part I will talk mostly about um, geometry nodes. And um, as you already know, I'm, I'm working on a, on a project that involves uh, a lot of uh, vegetation and, uh, and forest background. So Geometry Node was a huge help when, when doing set dressing and uh, creating those uh, environments. So speaking about the level of details, um, Geometry Node helped us uh, reduce um, RAM usage and increase performances 
both at render time and in the viewport in a, in a few different ways. Uh, the first one is we can, when scattering, display only the needed instances according to, to what we are working on. So for instance, on the top, uh, the top image is um, the viewport at uh, layout or animation stage, and you can see that the grass and flowers are only displayed near the path, so close to where the action would take place. But at render time, we display instances in uh, the complete field of the, of the camera. Geometry nodes also allows us to, to work with the lowest required level of detail um, created earlier. So you've already seen that with the Athleticus example with Axel. But on the top row, you can see that uh, grass flowers and especially trees are displayed in a um, uh, really low poly version. And um, we also tend to keep everything as uh, instances where, as far as it's possible. So this has two advantages, two benefits. The first one is keeping the object count in the scene uh, quite low, because you don't want uh, 200 flower objects in your scenes, of course. And the other benefit is that uh, it's always help with the um, RAM usage. So first of all, uh, a bit more about display instances only where they're needed. Um, this often relies on, uh, on vertex groups. So of course, when uh, building these sets, we heavily rely on vertex group to have control of where things should be. Um, vertex groups have a, a lot of benefits. First of all, it's very light. It's also really easy to, to manipulate. And um, a great, great thing about them is that you can also create them with geometry nodes in a procedural way. So that, that helps us a lot um, when having to create all the different parts of the forest with the different shapes of, uh, of path. So here on this GIF, you can, you can see me just decide the distance to the path to which I wanted to display uh, grass and, and flowers. So um, of course, we want this to be um, to be applied only in the viewport and not in the render. So uh, a few nodes that were uh, extensively used in, um, on this project is the switch node in combination with the is viewport node. And that basically allows us to have different inputs or different complete systems uh, in one node tree to manage how things are done in the viewport and on the other end, how they're done um, at render time. Uh, in this specific example, um, uh, the switch node controls the density of uh, grass and flowers in the, the example you've just seen. We also use um, the switch node with the is viewport switch uh, input to, to switch between different level of details of assets. So this can be uh, to, to get a difference between viewport and render, but it, it's also very useful when creating the different uh, level of detail versions of the assets. Because when creating the set dress of a forest, I want to create a version that would be suitable for layout and animation, and another version that would be suitable for rendering. But of course, I want the trees to be at the exact same place. I want the fern, the flowers, the bushes to be uh, really consistent in terms of, uh, of placement. So, Geometry nodes make all of this really easy and uh, pleasant to work with. So in this specific example on the node tree of the left, uh, we've got just a switch between different level of details for the, um, for the grass, but the same system is used for the flowers and the trees. And one side note here about the lowest level of the trees is that geometry nodes also, also help us when creating those um, low version of the trees. Because uh, decimating um, leaves of a tree is uh, always a struggle to do it in an efficient way. But with geometry node, we can easily convert all the leaves into points uh, with, uh, for example, a merge by distance node. And then you can decide to keep only 2% of those points and scatter planes on those with a leaves texture. So um, just in a few nodes, you, you have a setup that allows you to create really quickly a um, low polygon version of all the little trees while maintaining the global shape and the proportion of the foliage. 
So um, when doing scattering with um, geometry nodes, the, um, the main concept is always duplicating instances on points. So uh, the question that remains is, how do you generate those points? How do you get, how do you get them? Do you model them or do you do it procedurally? Of course, it depends on the level of control you want and the, um, the speed at which you want things to be done. So at Cube, we use different methods uh, according to our needs, according to the importance of the objects we want to scatter. So I will, I will show you how we do this in a few different ways. So the most obvious method is just using generated, uh, procedurally generated points with a dis distribute point on surface, for example, node. And in combination with um, vertex groups, you still can get a lot of control or, on how things look. Um, vertex groups and procedural textures in geometry nodes um, helps you bring a bit more an organic feel um, on this. And it's very simple to get, um, to get a, a first pass of your, of your grass flowers. And for all those small elements that are in a huge number, uh, doing things fully procedurally is um, often the best uh, scenario. Then for bigger objects like trees, uh, we want to control the specific placement of them. But um, we still want them to be instances and um, uh, we still want to be able to have a procedural uh, variation among them in terms of uh, scale and in terms of uh, switching, switching from one model to the other. So what we do is um, we create um, a mesh with only vertices no, no faces, no polygons, just floating points. And we just use an um, instance on points node on them. So we get uh, one instance by vertex. So what you see here is just me in uh, edit mode duplicating vertices and, and places them to get new trees with a random variation on any parameter I want. And um, here geometry nodes helps us also make sure that the tree the trees properly stick to the ground, and uh, in some cases that the duplicated assets also behave according to the normal of the ground surface. And um, in a few other cases, we can use a combination of both of those methods. So to create those unique bunch, uh, bunches of flowers, we, um, we use a modeled a point cloud, so just a mesh with only vertices. And uh, so we can uh, precisely place uh, those bunches of flowers. But uh, we, we scatter on them uh, procedurally generated small point clouds to, to get uh, variation um, in terms of how many flowers we got per, per bunch. If we want even more control, um, because Vertices in Blender don't store um, rotation and scale information. So if we want more control on how we place, rotate, and scale our objects, we can use a mesh with um, floating single polygons, so just little squares floating in a mesh, and uh, duplicating an instance per polygon. So the node tree for this is a bit more complicated, but on the other hand, it allows us to control the rotation and the scale on top of uh, placement of, uh, of each object. So um, that's it for our, a few tips uh, about uh, procedural workflow. Uh, please feel free to, to ask anything if you need uh, more information on that. Thank you very much. So um, I guess we have a, a few minutes for uh, Q&A if, uh, if you want any information on this. Yes? Um, the picture of the animation with the small beard. Yes. Uh, is it an adaptation from, I've seen a comic book? Is yes, it's a French comic book by uh, Emile Bravo, okay. called uh, in French uh, Les Sept Oursena, okay. which is uh, adapted by uh, Folivari and Netflix. And uh, so yeah, uh, we're in charge of creating the images, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, of course. 
Ja, klopt. Yes. Yes, uh, that's right. So we have um, two, two possibilities. Uh, either we rely on the automatic process. So um, with a configuration file, we can say that for the low two version, we want uh, decimate modifiers applied on the mesh with uh, so-and-so uh, parameters. And we can also, per asset, decide that with a custom collection in, um, in the working file, we can decide that for the specific assets, we don't want to use decimation, but we want to use another way of creating a low polygon version. This is the case for the trees, for example. So in our working file, we would just duplicate the whole asset and rename the main collection with low2 in it, so that when pushing our assets and making it available for other steps, the script will detect this collection and avoid the automatic, uh, automatic process and just take what we've done manually. So it's a way to override the process. So for most of the props, we can rely on the automatic process. But on those specific use cases, uh, we can do things the way we want. And this counts for every level of detail. I, uh, I can create a custom high two level of details and or custom low, low one or anything. Um, yes. In the, um, so first of all, in the configuration files, we we can choose the default state of this to have um, um, a combination of let's say for all my high one modeling, I want my high one shaders. But <clears throat> when when doing those uh, custom LOD in working fly, we can assign the shaders we want from another level of detail, and that will be kept. Another thing to be said is that in a layout or animation shot, the artist can switch level of detail independently uh, for modeling, rigging, and shading. So of course, it's not compatible in every way because the rigging relies on a specific topology and sometimes shaders do too. But as long as uh, the, the shaders will be compatible with the, the other mesh or the, the rig would be compatible with the, with the mesh, the artist can choose to increase the level of detail of the shaders, for example, if they want to see the, the actual rendering shader in the animation scene for a specific object. Yes? Um, between the different levels of detail of the rigs, yes. um, do they interact with each other? Like, if you do something with the base rig, does it influence the... Um, like, for example, you'll start some, something with the base rig, and then you will switch to the high level, the high two rig. Um, is the high two rig at that point static, or does it get the information you did with the base? The, the thing is between the different level of details of the rigs is that the existing controllers have the same name between one of them, uh, uh, between each other, so that um, when upgrading the level of the rig, you keep the animation you've done with the lowest one. So if I've at the out stage. Uh, somebody worked with the, the base rig with only um, a rotation scale and placement controllers. Uh, when you switch to the higher version of rigs, you, you keep this, uh, this animation. Of course, if you, if you lower the resolution of the rig, you, you, lose, you lose what's not available anymore in terms of control. This is because the, the objects uh, share the same uh, action data, because they have the same name and the bones are named in the same way. Yes? Basically, when, um, when doing set dressing for a forest, uh, for instance, um, the, the procedural thing happens 
at the asset creation part, uh, level, but not in the shot. So the, um, the asset has a lot of things procedurally generated, but when the, the, um, the shot builder script imports all the assets, uh, it doesn't matter if the grass is uh, procedurally generated or not. And so the layout artist or the animator that will work in the shots um, will, uh, um, the, doesn't necessarily have the information of how things were built. The only difference is that, of course, if, um, if flowers are scattered in a procedural way, the animator or layout artist won't be able to, to <clears throat> move uh, individual flowers. Whereas uh, if uh, table chairs are put uh, manually in a set, they will be able to... Do you give any information about this to the asset manager or... No, no, no. It's, uh, we, we don't have this kind of uh, information uh, displayed in, in the asset manager. Yes? Um, your asset manager, you show me this is a follow-up question. So you showed this as a value add model. Yes. I guess this connects to the database, right? Yes. Do you also have uh, an application that manages the database, or is it only the blender add which writes and reads from the database? So we have a lot of different applications to manage this database. Uh, in terms of production tracking, we use Kitsu by uh, CGWire. And um, we have also an, a tool called um, Emma Watson, which allows us to, to choose what file we want to open and that handles uh, file naming, versioning, and, uh, and sorting. And um, so, yes, we, we've got a few different tools to, to manage um, this database. The, the one we're showing here is the one used by uh, layout artists and animators within a shot that only handles what inside the, these shots when, once the scene has been created. I, I don't know if that answers your, your question. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, any other questions? Great, so thank you guys. Thank you.